I say this, we're going to cover the entire chapter of a Bible. I'm talking about Psalm 119. <laughs> Malachi chapter 4 is where we will be, and we'll close this out. Just an incredible <coughs> section of scripture. It's actually the, it's the, the continuation of what we know as chapter 3. And what I like about this, I'll give you the sort of the ending first before the beginning. Did you ever go to a firework show? Mm -hmm. And you have a, a sudden burst of fireworks happening, and you're thinking, man, I've been ripped off. It's only been five minutes, and the grand finale is here. And then, you, then suddenly there's a few more, and then ten minutes later is the real grand finale. Yeah. That's how the book of Malachi closes out. Malachi chapter 3 into chapter 4 deals with the coming the first coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. And he was rejected by his people. But praise the Lord for those who did receive him, gave him power to become the sons of God. Right. What a joy that is. But his people, the nation of Israel, rejected him. But praise the Lord when we look at this chapter here in Malachi 4. His people are going to receive him but they will come under judgment first in the great tribulation. That will be the grand finale of all human history when the kingdom of God, with Jesus Christ sitting in Jerusalem on David's throne. You know there's people today that think the throne of David is in London and the queen sits on it? No, the throne of David is going to be in Jerusalem in the very same temple that will be rebuilt. What a joy that will be. But let's pick it up in verse number four, or, or chapter number four, in verse number one. He says, for behold, I'll just read through, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud day and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branches. Right. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet, and the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse." Mm. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless your word this morning, Lord, and may we have clarity over, over what it says to us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first off, in verse number one of chapter four, it says, For behold, why, why does God's word want us to behold? It's because of verse number 16, 17, and 18 before. Right. Let's look at those for a second. It says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Amen. Then shall he return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Right. See, all throughout all of the Old Testament, God has shown his grace and mercy to a remnant, a remnant of those who simply believed. They had faith in God that God would one day keep his promises 
No matter how bad things had looked. This is the message of chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Malachi. The priests, those that were supposed to be doing the work of God, had gotten the people to follow not God, but their own ideas of God. After all, if God has all these promises, why are the wicked being blessed? Why do those that commit evil, why do they prosper? God must be on their side. We have that same attitude today, and unfortunately much of the church is changing to that. Whatever works, whatever floats your boat, that's what we must do. Hmm. Whatever's pragmatic and brings in people, rather than being grounded in Scripture, being ungrounded by in the rocks of emotionalism and every wind and wave of doctrine that comes down the pipe. So this is the context where verse number, well, chapter four, I keep on saying verse four, but chapter four and verse number one is four. Because God has a remnant that he's saving, God has his peculiar people. That's what this crown is being prepared. God has a peculiar people that are prepared. It says, for behold, the day cometh. The day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thing. Back in chapter 3, we see this judgment of God, but that will be a refining judgment for his people. Know that to get good gold, it has to go through the fire. It has to be purged of the dross and all the impurities in it. That's what chapter 3 is dealing with, with his people that will go through it. But now in chapter 4, this is a total judgment and decimation of the land and of the people. It really saddens me to think that in the book of Revelation, it'll be about one-third of the people will be consumed. And except because of God's mercy and his love for the elect, his love to keep Jacob, a seed of Jacob, a true nation of Israel, intact, that day of judgment would be cut short. Mm. See, if God had his way with the world outside of his grace shown to us through Jesus Christ, every single man, woman, and child would be destined for the lake of fire. That's right. It's a sad thing. The only remedy and refuge away from God's eternal judgment is to simply trust him. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I always think back before I was saved, all the things I believed. I picked up a Spirit of Truth magazine. Have you ever seen those in restaurants and things? It's a New Age ma magazine. They're the ones that are supposed to be tolerant, but you can go and learn about your peculiar angel. You can have chakras and reiki and reiki and all these different ways so you can find God in your own way. Well, God has revealed only one way. He's revealed it through his holy prophets and apostles. And by the way, there are none of those today. Right. We have God's word on it today. He has sealed this up. And these last days, the book of Hebrews says, he has spoken through his son, right. Jesus Christ. He is the finished word. He is the final word. And it's in this Bible we have our only hope and security. That's right. I had mentioned before a couple of weeks ago the, the statement of, of the, who's the guy that's the, that runs the Roman church? Oh, the Pope. He claimed that pe when people, when sinners die, they simply disappear. I wish that were true. Yeah. As we'll see, they won't just disappear. They will be in eternal torment. That's right. Eternal torment because they deserve it. Because they didn't believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For behold, that day cometh. It will come. They weren't, weren't, ex they weren't expecting it. They had turned away from the Lord. They weren't patient with him.
But yet God's word says that he is patient and long-suffering for all. He desires that all would come to repentance. He sent his son. What a sign that was. We looked at it just a couple weeks ago. The empty tomb. That was the sign that would be used, that would verify that he alone is God. That's right. There's no other deities <clears throat> that we can look to but God and his son, Jesus Christ. This day is coming. The great tribulation will last seven years. And it will ramp up in the final three and a half years of that. It will be a time like has never been or never will be once again in this world. But God has promised that those that would believe in him would be rescued from that. Let's go to the, back to the book of Joel. Joel chapter 2. While you're in Joel, we're going to look at a couple in Amos in a couple minutes, too. Joel chapter number two. Verse number one says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. See, Joel expected the day of the Lord to be any time. Mm -hmm. We can expect that any time as well. We can expect for the Christian, for the church, which was a mystery that wasn't even revealed in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament under Paul. We can expect for us, for that trumpet to sound, and we can be escaping out of here. People say, well, you're an escapist. Praise the Lord. Right. I'll escape with Jesus rather than stick around here and see what you go through. Right. Verse number two says, A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. A great people and a strong there hath never been over the like. Neither shall be any more of it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and before them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape. See, that's another prophetic uh, passage pointing right up to the book of Revelation. That this land will be decimated, will be judged, but behold, there is a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. What started out in the book of Genesis with the fall of Adam in the Garden of Eden will be completed in the new Jerusalem. The Lord will come and establish his kingdom and all will become new. That's the message of Revelation chapter 21. Right. Let's go, let's leave, let's leave Joel here for a second. And go to the first second Thessalonians chapter number one. Second Thessalonians chapter number one. Let's start with verse number one. It's only twelve verses. Let's read the, the whole twelve verses. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and the tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that we may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which we also suffer. 
See, Paul was telling them their persecutions that they were going through through the Romans and the Judaizers. Judaizers, they were just a small token of the judgment that would be yet to come. And by the way, that judgment has not come yet. Right. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. So he said, don't worry about those who trouble you. God will take care of you of them. Right. And God will take care of them. And to you who are troubled, this is my favorite part of this, rest with us. Now they were enduring real literal persecution. And today we get, might get called a name, we might get called a, a Bible thumping wingnut or a, a Jesus lover. And we, we cower back. But they were actually getting persecuted. Rest with us. The only solution we have is the rest that's found in Jesus Christ. That's right. See, it took Joshua, another Jesus, to get the people into the promised land. It's going to take Jesus Christ to get the people into the heavenly promised land, into the, the kingdom of God, into the new Jerusalem. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That kind of narrows it down to who is going to be judged. Right. Those who obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has given everything that we need pertaining to life and godliness. It's found in the scriptures. And even those who have never read the scriptures, there's enough evidence in the world to say that we have a creator. Amen. Does the sun rise in the morning? Does it set in the afternoon? Does the moon come out? Do the stars come out? These are all evidences that there is a God. And yet... He would send his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer, bleed, and die on a cross. That gospel is as plain as can be. 1 Corinthians 15 states it plainly. That if you believe that, that he died on the cross according to the scriptures, he was, he was buried and rose again according to the scriptures, if you believe that, and nothing else. Mm -hmm. That is obeying the gospel. That's right. I'm saddened I came out of a religious, religious system that, that didn't just believe that. We had to believe the code of canon law. We had to believe the catechism. We had to believe what the man in Rome said that superseded what scripture says. I'm so glad for the simple word of God. But you things, man has complicated things so much. Just like in ancient Israel, it wasn't enough to follow God. We had to make idols to other gods. This invisible God was just too invisible for me. But he will come in flaming fire. Look at verse number 9. It says, Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power? When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because your testimony among you was believed in that day. Amen. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. That the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, there's no other name under heaven by which a man must be saved but right. the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful it's that simple. It's an easy message. He has given his son. Bottom line. We, let, we love to complicate things. We love to think that we could have, we could be as powerful as God and we could impact our salvation. But that's impossible. There is no earthly man 
that has the power that the Lord Jesus Christ has. None of us would have the power to forgive sins. Only the crucified Savior could do that. Now let me continue here by turning over to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 20. I still have my finger in Amos. I haven't gotten there. I like going to the end of the book of Revelation because it's so much more palatable than the middle part. The middle part's all blood and guts and judgment. <coughs> Revelation chapter 20. We will go through the whole chapter. Verse number 10 says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And keep on adding ever and ever and ever. It'll be an eternity. And verse number 11 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before the God, before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And by the way, if we were to go according to our book, our works, we would all be condemned because right. all, all of our works are as filthy rags. Right. They, they take us away. There is no such thing as a righteous person. Look what happens. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So if you think the grave is the end of your life, look at that verse. The grave is just the beginning because what comes after is forever. Good solution. Number one, if you believe the gospel, you'll have a resurrected body and be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever. If you don't believe the gospel, here's what happens. Right. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Back in verse number 10, what was the lake of fire? They tormented day and night forever and ever. <clears throat> Sad to say, I wish it were easy. I wish that my body would just rot away and, and that would be the end of me, but I have to look to an eternity. Is it going to be the lake of fire or is it going to be verse number 15 or, or or, or, or ver chapter 21, which we'll go to, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, the Jews, if we were to go back to Malachi 3, verse 16, it says there was a book of remembrance opened for them, for the remnant of Jews. The Jews are automatically God's elect and when they don't believe the gospel, they're taken out of the book of life. And that leaves a void for the Gentiles to come later. When you believe the simple truth of the gospel, you are written into that book of life. Amen. What, be, what befell the Jews, this is Romans chapter 10 and 11, is for the benefit of the Gentiles. Their loss became our gain. So in God's providence, he had to keep a remnant. He needed somebody from the line of David to rule after Adam blew it. And that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. So he kept a remnant all through history. He kept the line of David right through Jesus Christ. And he kept a remnant of believers or Jewish believers and we as Christians are grafted into that root of the Jews. So we get to partake in that book of life. We get to partake into the blessings of Israel. If you say that Israel is not blessed, look at them today. Mm -hmm. 
You can see they're the, they're the enemy of almost all the area surrounding them. Right. They are the tail. How many of we heard that about private people say, you can be the head, not the tail. If you give enough money to a ministry, you can be the head, not the tail. But that's about Israel. Israel was supposed to be God's mount, uh, city on the mountain. So it's supposed to be God's special people or peculiar people that would show forth his righteousness. But instead, they rejected God. After Malachi, there was 400 years of silence with the scriptures. Then Jesus came and he was rejected by his nation once again. But praise the Lord, there will be a time coming. I don't know when. But there will be revival in Israel. They will receive their Messiah and Savior, Jesus Christ. Then you see the rest of Malachi chapter 4 taking place, as well as the whole prophetic calendar in the entire Old Testament. We make a mistake of trying to apply all these promises to Israel unto ourselves. We get to go along for a ride. Mm -hmm. I, remember I, was, I remember when I was a kid, I would go out running errands with my dad. And I would think to myself, boy, my dad and I, well, I didn't use that good English then, me and dad, we're going to go out and do errands. He did all the work. I just sat there pretending I was driving. Yeah, I can do this. This is cool. He did all the work. That's what it is with the Lord. He does all the work. We are partakers and benefactors of his work and his work alone. Let's go back to Malachi. Oh yeah, while we're here in Revelation, let's let's go here. Let's go to Revelation 21 while we're here. Instead of going back to it later. Revelation chapter 21. Just the first seven verses. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he said, He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he, and he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life. Freely, Amen. he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my people. Amen. You know how one overcomes? We can't overcome by trying to be good. That's impossible. We, we overcome by what Jesus Christ, the righteous, the only perfect man, that ever lived, he was righteous. I have to clarify that he was perfect because he was God and man at the same time. He left his place of glory. See, because what we needed, what the earth needed, was a sacrifice, was, was a punishment. See, if, to you, somebody, if, if Butch deserved death, would it profit if I sacrifice somebody else in his place? No, he is the one that 
that did the dirty deed that needs death. All of humanity is guilty before God. There's not a single person before God that is perfect enough to satisfy God's wrath. Right. But Jesus Christ was and is. He is the faithful one. He is the one, the only one to look to. In verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's right. And for, and I won't go just because of time's sake, in the New Testament earlier, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We see a list of those things. But Paul has these great words. He says, such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been cleansed, by the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my paraphrase. You have homework. First Corinthians chapter 6. We'll see all the abominations of the world that will be judged. We were all there. I was guilty as charged. Mm -hmm. My face needs to be on the <clears throat> post office wall. I mean, that's a bad analogy because I think my face is on the post office. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't know I work for the post office, so yeah. <laughs> my ID badge is right on, on the wall. But we all deserve to be there. Most wanted. I almost did put, a, uh, put that picture up there and put a bullseye up there as well. Most wanted. We're sinners. And Jesus Christ paid the price. All right, now let's go back to Malachi. Is it just me, or is it the older you get, you can't turn pages? Mm. <laughs> So we see this, this judgment that will leave neither root nor branch. It will be thorough, thorough as can be. All deserve this judgment. <coughs> Look at verse number two. But, as you know, that's one of my favorite words in the Bible. But, here's this judgment upon the entire world. But, mark that down, circle that, but... Unto you that fear my name, that reverence Yahweh, that reverence Jehovah. Remember the backdrop, the nation, except for a remnant right here in chapter 3, had rejected God. They had their own religion. After all, why do we need what God has done? It's useless. But unto you that fear my name, Shall the Son of Righteousness rise with healing in his wings, and he shall go forth and grow up as calves of the storm? Amen. There's a twofold meaning to this, the Son of Righteousness. Number one, it's looked at often as being the Messiah, Jesus Christ. He will rise with healing in his wings. And number one, which encompasses Jesus but the son of righteousness will be the very state of the world after the tribulation. Mm -hmm. You ever gone through a severe thunderstorm? Literally like hiding in the basement? We've all done that before. It's so black and gloomy. The rain's coming down. The wind is, is, is coming. And it's fearful, is it not? Think of what the judgment of God will be like. It's fearful. But as soon as that cloud, that storm breaks, we see the rays of sun breaking through, and we can say, hallelujah, the storm is over. It's past. We're safe again. That's how it will be after the tribulation. Then will the sun of righteousness. It will be such a contrast that they'll know that righteousness now is inhabiting the earth 
The judgment is gone. The clouds are past. That day of gloominess. The darkness is gone. There's a new kingdom in town. That's the reality of that. Only ushered in by Christ the Lord. Today we're most of the world and sadly most of the church is rejecting Jesus. After all, we got better things to do. We got entertainment. We got pleasure. We have our own thing. We have our own relationships we deal with. But if you believe and trust in what Christ has done, he takes care of all that. Amen. There is no easy solution for your woes, your problems. The only solution is Jesus is the solution. Any kind of things that we have going on in our lives as Christians, we have but one duty. We just need to mine the Bible. Literally like gold. What does the word say? Instead, we write 100,000 different books. You can, you can go into a bookstore and find 100 different books about how to have a good life. Not a good wife, a good life. Oh, well, we'll add wife in there too. Why not? How to have how to have a relationship? You can find a hundred different authors, but yet I can think of just one. Amen. The Holy Spirit of God moved these men to write. Over the space of thousands of years, they had a central point. If you read the scriptures. Don't be afraid of the prophets. Right. So many people think the minor prophets are so minor that they had nothing to say. But the minor prophets are major. Mm -hmm. They point to Jesus Christ. They don't That's point right. to me. If I had my best life now, as Joel Osteen would say, or as, as the Paul would say, we're men most to be pitied. We are men most miserable. We have a better thing to look for. And that is the kingdom of God, which will be ushered in by Jesus alone. We don't have to build it. Think of what he did with six days. God created the entire earth. That's right. I think for 2,000 years, he's been creating something even better. I can't <laughs> imagine what that will be like. Amen. Amen. Now let's go to Amos chapter 9. Amos chapter 5. I still have like 10 minutes left. Or so. uh -oh. I said keep your finger there. I took my note. So Joel then Amos. <coughs> By the way, to get the real context of what's going on, read the first eight chapters. The first nine gives us the end. Right. Verse number nine says, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the post may shake and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. That though they dig into hell, then shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. There's no escape from God's judgment. Right. You specifically write to the Assyrians here, by the way. But it has future ramifications, as we'll see at the end of the chapter. And though they hide themselves in the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence. And though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence will I command the serpent... And he shall bite them. Mm -hmm. I thought, God, I thought you could pick up serpents. And they wouldn't hurt you. But no, God will command the serpents. Go down in those holes where they're hiding and bite them. That's the judgment of God. And though they go into captivity before their enemies, thence will I command the sword, and it shall slay them, and I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. What a mighty God we serve. Yes, he is mighty. But he's also holy. And he 
desires holiness. He commands holiness from you and me. Thank God for Jesus. Amen. I can't be holy no matter what. I can look holy. I can put on a holy tie or a holy shirt. And, and sometimes I have actual holes in my shirts and stuff. But no matter what I do, it's nothing. No matter how good I think I can be, it's nothing compared with the holiness of God. And the Lord, verse number five, and the Lord God of hosts is he that toucheth the land and it shall melt and all that dwell therein shall mourn and it shall rise up holy like a flood and shall be drowned as by the flood of Egypt. Think of that next time you hear a worship song that talks about the heaven melting. It's not good news. The earth melting is not a good thing. That's judgment that God is bringing. It is he that buildeth his stories in the heaven and hath founded his troop in the earth. He that calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his, is his name. And to think we can have some kind of level of holiness to be equal with that. I can't even fill. I tried to fill up Dorothy Pond down the street from us. I took a cup just like my water cup here, and poured it in once, it didn't do anything. And we think that we're all powerful, but yet God himself, all of the heavens themselves, Isaiah chapter 40 says, are just a drop in the bucket for God. Mm. He, is, he has done everything. We can't even fathom all that he's done. Verse number seven, are you not as children of the Ethiopians unto me? O children of Israel, saith the Lord, have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtor and the Syrians from Kerr? I'm the one that delivered you. If it weren't for me, you would have no hope whatsoever. Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. Oh, no, that's another verse are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. Hmm. We can cross-reference that back to Malachi chapter 1. It was in Jacob that, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that the seed of, of the land, the kingdom promises would come through, as well as the future promises through Jesus Christ of the seed of Jacob. It all ties together. The only way that we can really put it together is if we read it, if we read it and study it and realize it's not for us, but it has kingdom ramifications that we are not in. Verse number nine, for lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations. That's a big one there because Revelation chapter 12 tells us that he's going to keep take those people from all the four corners of the earth and he's going to bring them back into his land mm -hmm. right at the midpoint of the tribulation. He's going to keep them in <laughs> Uh, what we would call Petra, but back into the land of Edom, that area, he will protect them, and then they will go into the kingdom once Jesus Christ rules, once he sits on his throne. And I'll tie this all together in a second. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, which say the evil shall not overtake nor prevent, prevent us. That's a common theme among all the prophets. The false prophets were promising good. Right. Nothing's going to happen to you. You're going to be wealthy. You're going to be wise. Sounds like the prophets of today. Hmm. Same exact thing. They, they stoned. They killed the prophets who told them the truth that they needed to repent for their sins and God would deliver them. They were rejected. But look, let's look at verse 11. In that day, what day? The day of the Lord. That's right. In that day, that's how, that's how Malachi chapter 4, it says 4, in that day. Will I raise up the tabernacle of David, 
that has fallen. That's, that is so incredible. There are people that think that the kingdom of God, that New Jerusalem, will be someplace else in the earth. Some even in this country. Some people think that the kingdom of uh, the throne of David is a secret throne. It's been hidden, and you need to be a Gnostic to understand where it is. Some then think that the kingdom of God, the throne of David, is in your heart. But no, he will raise it up right. and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Edom. Again, go to Revelation chapter 12. You'll see the, where the Edomites who have been cursed by God because they rejected by God, but God is going to use their land. We see the ancient city of Petra today. I've never been there. I've only seen pictures of it. It's just an amazing city built in the cliffs. That is one day going to be inhabited for people that are being protected by God during the tribulation, the tribulation saints of Israel. Behold, the days come and oh, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Right? The remnant of Edom and all the heathen. That's you and I. You want to be called a heathen? That just means of the nations. Mm -hmm. Of all the nations called by his name. Right. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed, and the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Think of back a couple weeks ago, we were looked at in Malachi chapter 3 about the church as a storehouse. Not. Those are blessings that are promised to Israel. If they got back to them, he would literally bring fruit, bring them food and provide for them. <coughs> and I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and, and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon where? Their upon land. their land. Mm. That land covers, covers an area about a third of the size of the United States. It goes from Egypt all the way into the middle of modern day Iraq and Iran. That is the land, the true promised land that was promised to Abraham. Right. And that has not been fulfilled and it's not a spiritual kingdom that many churches teach. It'll be a physical land right. that will be given. It'll be a seed, the people, and the land, and the promises that Abraham will be fulfilled one day. And I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Amen. The Abrahamic covenant, unconditional. It is still here today. We're not seeing it, but it is still valid today. The Mosaic Covenant, the law was given, that is conditional. That's why the Jews are out of the land, because they broke the Mosaic Covenant. They broke, they, when Moses got the Ten Commandments, they said, yes, Lord, we'll do whatever God says. What did they do while Moses was still up there? They were committing idolatry. The same thing is going, but the Abrahamic Covenant and his kingdom is still to come. Keep that in its historic sense. Now, one more place and I'll close here. Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. It's like, it's like my little sign there, here, that once you see what it says, you don't forget. Once you have a perspe proper perspective on the kingdom of God, you never forget. Right. So for some of you that don't know what the sign says, I'll tell you later. 
Isaiah chapter 60, we're going we're gonna to look at the first three verses and skip down to the end. Arise, shine, for the light is come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Mm. Who's thee? Thee is the nation of Israel. Thee mm. is Jerusalem. Thee are those people. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Here's what I like. Verse number three, it says, And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising. See, when Israel is back in our land, and Jesus is king, over that kingdom once again, the Gentiles will come to and fro. They will worship the Lord. Let's skip down to verse 18. Then shall also suck the milk of the Gentiles. Oh, that's 16. I meant 18. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation and thy gates praise. The sun shall be no more than light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee, but the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy morning shall be ended. The people also shall be all righteous, they shall inherit the land forever. Amen. Who was I here? Uh, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. Right. I'm going to close there. I said I would finish the book of Malachi today, but it won't happen. But there's a couple things. We see this judgment upon the world. We see this judgment upon the nation of Israel. We've also seen that there's only one refuge from this judgment, and that's to believe the gospel. That's right. That's to believe that he is the one that fulfills all these things that were written. There's no other person or no other God that can fulfill these. How do I know that? I know that by the empty tomb. I know that Jesus is still alive today. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He intercedes on our behalf. And he sent his Holy Spirit that convicts us of those very same things. And he's the one that testifies of righteousness and justice. There's one remedy. This remedy, <coughs> one remedy, if, if perchance you are not a Christian, there's only one remedy. Jesus Christ took your place. Mm -hmm. You deserved God's judgment. God's justice, rather than Jesus, he was perfect. He died, was buried, rose again. If you believe that in your heart, you have salvation. If you believe anything else, if you believe there's other ways to God, or that you have anything to do with salvation except for <coughs> believing, you need to believe the gospel. Right. If you are a Christian today, things aren't going the way it should be. They probably won't the way that you think it should be. All I know is we have a faithful God. Mm -hmm. And if we would look to him rather than the wisdom of this world, the sophistry of man, we would do much better. Mm -hmm. If we would look at the scriptures for what they say, Literally, and try to see what God has said rather than trying to see what we want God to say, that's when we'll have peace. And that alone. There's one way. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and thou shalt be saved. Save there has two meanings. Number one, if you're not a believer, he'll save you just by believing in that simple message. And if you are a believer, a Christian, he will save you through all of your trials. That's right, amen. And all of your difficulties by believing. We can't afford to be like the Jews who rejected God. He's gone too slow. God's so boring. Let's make him more exciting. But only through the patience of looking to him. And by the way, if anybody ever has questions about the scriptures, I don't know at all. I do know somebody that does. He's not sitting in this room, but he's right in the pages That's right. of, these, of this Bible. Take everything in context, and it clears up so much more. My door, oh, look, the door is open right now. The door is open. I'd love to talk about the scriptures. I'd love to talk about the simplicity of salvation and what Jesus has done on our behalf. Amen.